Chapter 4. Again, I calmly stood, waiting for the space vessel to come closer, and for the door to open. This was done and the same two beings that usually welcomed me appeared, standing in the same order as they did the day before, and looking just as solemn. I greeted them in the Essene manner, this time smiling and feeling quite calm, as I now trusted them. The ladder was lowered and I climbed up. We went through the same round of rituals passing along the curbing corridor to the same room where the woman and her companions waited. After we had sat down and were secured in our seats, the vessel shot up, following the same trajectory as the day before. Then as they were maneuvering to descend on Mount Cameroon, a signal flashed at one of the buttons near the large, TV, screen. The woman pointed a small pen-like device at it and a view of Mount Cameroon appeared on which there were people climbing the mountain. She even brought the view in close-up and I could see that it was white people, dressed in shorts and t-shirts with climbing shoes and full climbing equipment, with rolls of strong ropes. These were probably some of the tourists who regularly go around climbing mountains in Africa and around the world. They were accompanied by two Cameroonian guides, who both also seemed to be very experienced climbers and were also dressed like them. It was quite amazing to see these people in such close-up, since the vessel was so high up that I doubted the climbers would even see it if they looked up. The brown man in our company whispered a few words and the vessel immediately shot back up into the sky towards another direction. After what seemed like only five minutes the sides of the vessel became transparent again and I saw us just landing on a flat desert landscape at the shade of a huge sand dune. My God! Where on earth are we now? I exclaimed suddenly alarmed. It is all right, replied the black being dash we are still in Africa, further north to your country, here. He pointed at the screen on which an aerial view of Africa appeared. The Sahara Desert? God! This is the very first time I have ever left Cameroon. The Sahara, I exclaimed and rushed to look at the landscape through the walls of the craft whose doors remained firmly closed. Even though I knew that it was very hot outside, it remained comfortably cool inside. The transparency of the walls of the craft was withdrawn leaving it as it looked before. Then the white being turned toward me. Well we shall continue where we left yesterday. Did you access the message easily? he asked. Yes, very captivating. I said, smiling nervously. You shall find it easier as time goes by, and as you keep on accessing the messages. Now would you please follow me? He got up and so did I but as the black being who still looked very familiar to me made no attempt to follow us, I was very reluctant to follow the other one. When they all saw this, they seemed to converse telepathically, because he got up and said, Do not be afraid. I'll be right there with you. Then he got up and led the way and I followed, with the white one closing behind. They took me again to the same operating couch. One of the small aliens who, I admit, rather frightened me a little, was already there. I did not like him coming near me and the others had probably read my mind again because the white being came and put the casket on my head. Even though I had guessed that it was the small alien who operated the medical equipment, I was rather relieved that he did not do it while I watched. A prick on my wrist sent me into a profound sleep. I awoke with the pretty diamond-eyed female being standing next to me. The most amazing thing was that I was standing up and in the room where we usually sat, not in the operating theatre. I was confused and was wondering how I happened to be standing up as I had just awakened from my sleep. And how did I get into this room? Did I walk or was I carried? It is time for you to go, we shall meet again tomorrow at the same time, she said, again handing me the same beverage I had been given before. I looked around and the two beings that had always been first to greet me got up on their feet and smiled, as I made no attempt to take the drink. Drink it. It is to help your memory, the brown being said. I emptied the very sweet and minty drink in one long gulp, as the sides of the craft became transparent. We had arrived back at my grandfather's cocoa plantation. I descended down the ladder turned round and took leave of them, saying, Peace be with you. And with thee, said the brown being. I stepped back under the trees as the vessel went up. Then I walked back home at a very leisurely pace, looking at the ground and lost in my thoughts. 
People told me later that I had walked past them without replying to their greetings. The truth is, I frankly do not remember hearing or even noticing them. All the time, I was preoccupied about the new installment of information that had again been recorded in my brain and wondered what it would be. I could hardly wait to find out. All my chores were done in such a state of distraction that I was not even aware that I was doing them. I simply worked by instinct. I had even started making some peanut butter by the time my grandmother came back from the farm. I cooked dinner then I went to swim in the river that runs near the village. As it turned out, I had not heard her properly. The general meeting was not supposed to be taking place that day after all. When I returned, I declared that I was going to revise my lessons and would go straight to sleep afterwards. The message of the third day. Instead I went to bed straight away to access the message, it was half past seven in the evening. The message came immediately. It said. Now we shall continue with our story. First let me recapitulate. The leaders of the renegades, namely Kingu, Lucifer, Namtar, Leviathan, Diamat, Satan, and Azag, Belial, and all their armies, legions, and cohorts of rebels and dissidents, had already been banished from our worlds. They had come with their alien bodies and a divine and eternal decree had put them at the feet of any human beings, who could manage to access their divine powers through the spirit messiah within. That means that any such human being will never be under the power of the princes of the devils named above. This is also a divine power granted to us because, with the mysteries, we too evolved to become as gods. But as this subject is part of the mysteries that you were taught by your grandfather, any more teachings that we shall give you on that matter for your own intention and that of your future followers alone, Desiree. Therefore keep them from the ears of the profane and do not write them in the book containing this message. Now we will continue with our story. We had left behind armies of officers to watch and guard the humans, and monitor their progress. The humans called them watchers and guardian angels. Note that angel simply means messenger in our language. Not very long after we left, the leaders of the renegades came and tempted these watchers to desert and join their ranks. Then they contacted all the Adams and Eves and the others that we had created and their children and tempted them to disobey and listen to them. They began with the couple that we created, who lived at the laboratory city that we had built in Palestine. Eve was first, and she was tempted into having sexual intercourse with Gadrel, one of the watchers who had rebelled, and she encouraged her husband Adam to have carnal relations with one of the lady watchers. But let me clarify the situation of our creation work a little more before we continue. You see after we succeeded in creating Adam and Eve in Palestine we did not simply stop at that first couple. We began creating large batches of children from them. We only needed just one first couple. Once it was successfully created we observed them till they passed the age of ten years. First, many males and females were created through genetic manipulation of their DNA, using specially treated ovules collected from the first Eve. So when these children reached puberty, which was usually at eleven earth years for girls, and thirteen for boys, we collected ovules from the girls, and sperm from the boys and made children in our labs combining the genetic material of our white-skinned scientists, in making these children. We used large artificial and very sophisticated womb-like machines that could each hold up to twelve fetuses at a time. Conditions in these machines were the same as those you find in human female wombs, but even better. We added all the appropriate nutrients needed to produce perfect, healthy, full-size babies in the shortest times possible. As there was a lot of space in these breeding machines, we could deliberately cause the ovules to split and produce up to eight or ten fetuses at a time, and of course such children were identical. These were mass breeding campaigns, in which we treated the females to produce large amounts of ovules each month. With at least a hundred of these machines in any one laboratory, you can imagine the scale to which these breeding programs amounted to, around the planet. Of course all the children were monitored and studied for inherited diseases from us. Any babies found to have inherited our diseases and illnesses were destroyed. We could thus make 9,600, 9,600, babies a year per laboratory at least. 
I am afraid these children were all kept apart in their different laboratories and not allowed to meet in order to mate until we were absolutely sure that our experiment had become a success. Nothing less than that could satisfy us. Remember our aim for coming to Earth was for that scientific creation experiment. And the children we created were scientific subjects. We loved them of course, but they were scientific subjects nonetheless. Now in our laboratory situated here in Africa, the first atom we created in this continent, was produced through manipulation of our combined genetic materials with the material of the brown-skinned scientist's material being predominant. That work was going on while Adam was also being created in Palestine. Once that first couple had been created in Palestine, ovules, eggs, were removed from Eve and fertilized in our African laboratory, to create a male African Adam, and African female Eve. So the first children bred in Africa were of darker skin color, mixed from the Palestinian Eve's genetic material, and that of one of us. Thus we knew that breeding between both brown and pink humans was perfectly possible. Using treated and purified genetic information from this same brown-skinned scientist who has been meeting you every day, a few more beings were created, because he had been particularly treated and purified and no dangerous genetic defaults as we have in our world existed in him. From these first dark-skinned children, was created the pure African black skin color as you know it, ovules from the first new black female being again fertilized, using the first black-skinned Adam. That way, we made darker and darker Africans. After that, we began mass breeding just like we were doing in the Palestinian laboratory. Our creation work in Africa was much easier than the one that was first undertaken in Palestine. Please note that when our ancestors had first come all those billion of years before, they had created their first Adam in a laboratory that had been situated in Africa. Also, that Adam was dark-skinned. In fact their annals say that only that first African laboratory was used for creation in their time. Our creation and breeding work was thus effectuated throughout the planet in our different laboratories. In the Orient, in our Chinese laboratory, the first Adam was created with the genetic materials of the green aliens being predominant. In the Indian laboratory, we used genetic material from the first alien hybrids we created in Africa, crossed them with genetic material from some of the Palestinian ones, to directly mass breed the Indian batches. It was only when we had created hundreds of thousands of children from the first Adams and Eves and were satisfied of their purity, that we allowed these original couples only, to mate naturally, before the rest. In age, they were in their twenties. All Adams were aged twenty-eight, and all Eves were twenty-five years old. Up till then, their education had not been neglected. They had been taught about God, and about where we had come from. We taught them about how we prepared this solar system and about our creation work, as you can now read in your Bibles. We also taught them about our ancestors and the work of creation they had once done on earth long before us. Many of them were allowed to work in our scientific laboratories, but their duties were limited, the more serious work was undertaken by a lionin only. But that does not mean we dissuaded them from becoming scientists or from doing their own researches, only that they were not allowed to use our laboratories, they had their own built. Before being allowed to live together, the Palestinian Adam and Eve were properly married by Yahweh, the leader of our Council of the Wise. The other couples were married by one of our own people, who was later designated and left to be the supreme religious leader of this new human race created on earth after the teams of creators left. He was called Melchizedek. Thus right from the start, humanity was taught to respect the sanctity of marriage. We also monitored Eve's first pregnancy, as it was a multiple one of quads, two boys and two girls. While the girls were identical twins, Cain and Abel were not identical. Abel had blonde hair and blue eyes, while Cain had red hair and blue eyes. If we had created them in a laboratory, we would probably have destroyed them as not being perfect. But we decided to take a chance and let them both live. Eve was helped in that she did not suffer in giving birth. The babies were delivered under anesthesia and by caesarean section, after which her cut was treated and repaired and she was left totally without any visible scar. Such a delivery was necessary, as it was our very first natural pregnancy. As a precaution after that, 
Eve was still treated with contraceptives while we monitored these first four naturally conceived children. It was after they grew to be normal healthy and perfect children that we deemed our experiment to be a total success. Then the male and female children of Adam that we had mass bred in the laboratories, and whom up to then we had kept separated, were brought together in the cities we had built for them and allowed to marry. Cain and Abel and their two sisters, were thus described by Adam as being the first children, only because they were the very first with whom Eve had actually been pregnant. All humans were very well looked after to begin with. They were educated, clothed and fed without any need to work and toil to survive. All their children were painlessly delivered and all believed in God according to our own beliefs. And Adam administrated to them as their king, and religious leader. Later they were taught agriculture, and many of them set up homesteads and became farmers, growing food for the rest of them to enjoy. They effectively lived in luxury, so their cities were all called paradise. The same thing was done in all the continents, and then and only then did we decide to go away and leave them to evolve by themselves. When we left, Cain and Abel were fully grown men, and both were married with children. They still lived in these luxurious cities and had not yet been chased away. It was thus after our departure that the renegades came to earth and tempted some of the watchers to turn against us and join their ranks. These in their turn swayed Adam and Eve and most of their children. Abel remained faithful to us. Adam and Eve's son Cain, made a pact with Satan, in which he accepted Satan as his god. He murdered his brother Abel as a blood offering and as a sacrifice for that pact. He and Abel were forty years old when that murder was perpetrated. Then Cain married a renegade extraterrestrial lady and promised to bring all humanity to the worship of Satan and of the other renegades, and to rid earth of all people who tried to continue believing in the one true God. It was from then on that humans began calling the renegades Elohim, since these had presented themselves to the humans as gods and demanded to be worshipped by them as such. Cain himself was the first to produce children born of a direct union between people from our world and humans. These children were called Nephilim by the humans that were faithful to us, and which is ancient Hebrew for the fallen ones. The Adam that we created in Palestine had undergone the eternity operation when he was thirty years old, as had Eve also. Therefore he remained looking young to the last year he lived, over eight hundred earth years, before he moved to the next reality, after realizing his divinity on earth. But because we now know the contents of the story being told to the young man in France by Kingu, Lucifer, Tiamat, Satan, and Namtar, Leviathan, we shall also give our version of what happened in detail, as well as the rest of our message. And we shall continue to use the Bible when and as necessary. You shall excuse us if we are being too prolix here and are repeating ourselves. But you are young, and we need to imprint this message deep into your memory and your psyche, so that you will never forget it. And we are sure that you will welcome those repetitions. It is written that Adam, after the death of Abel had many sons and many daughters before he had Seth. And Adam lived a hundred and thirty years, and Adam knew his wife again. Genesis 4:25, And begat a son after his own likeness after his image, and called his name Seth. Genesis 5 4. The above passage means that for a period of one hundred and thirty years, Adam avoided making love to Eve. Instead he had intercourse with these extraterrestrial, or heavenly, ladies, and it is with them that he had those other sons and daughters. Those children were Nephilim, just like the children of Cain. The next time Adam did make love to Eve, Seth was conceived naturally and born. He was born after his likeness means that he was a pure human, not one of those mixed with the watchers. The blame does not only lean on Adam, because his wife Eve also did the same thing and gave birth to children whose fathers were the watchers. During those one hundred and thirty years they both refused to listen to Elianon, that is, Melchizedek who was specially chosen to represent the council of the wise on earth and those few watchers who had remained loyal to us, the same as they refused to worship God. Therefore those children were also evil like all the other Nephilim, which we Elianon disapproved of. They are the ones of whom it is written, and the sons of Adam loved Satan more than God. Adam and his wife were held in high esteem by the other humans. 
and when they saw them socialize with the rebel watchers and other renegade extraterrestrials, they also began to do the same. A lot of them married these extraterrestrials and a great deal of Nephilim began to be born. All the two hundred watchers and their legions that swore allegiance to Satan, chose a human wife each, approached them, and lived with them and had carnal intercourse with them. Now notice that the order of occurrence of events was not respected in the Bible. They happened this way. Adam and Eve remained in the beautiful paradisiacal cities long after what is now known as their fall. The faithful watchers had been forced to flee by the renegades, as they sought to kill them for refusing to ally with them, and the renegades and their human followers now lived in the cities. It was after these 150 years that Yahweh our leader himself returned, after having learnt of the state of things on earth. On Yahweh's return, a war took place. That is when Adam, Eve and all their children and the rest of the rebel humans were chased out of the cities that had been built for them, because the pure race that had been created had been compromised and destroyed by the renegades. Most of the diseases and illnesses that the pure race had not first inherited at their creation, had again been introduced by the renegades through the children they had with humans and by so doing, the scientific experiment of Elianin could no longer be called a success. Many of the cities that had been built by Elianin for the humans were destroyed, and Adam and the humans were left to fend for themselves. Cain also was separately punished for the murder of his brother and his allegiance to Satan. Lead by Melchizedek, the vacated laboratory cities were occupied by the good Elianin watchers, Abel's children and those humans who were still faithful to Elianin. From then on both factions lived in a constant state of war. The renegades completely took over the traitor humans and they began to use their wives to get at the rest of humans who did not join them immediately and to fight them. They taught them witchcraft enchantments and the magical properties of roots and trees. Not that this was wrong academically, but they abandoned proper teachings and instead, concentrated on introducing superstitions in their lessons. The women conceived and gave birth to children who grew into giants whose height reached 300 cubits, 4 meters, and who accepted and worshipped Lucifer, Satan, Leviathan and Belial as their gods. But before we even continue with the Nephilim, let us see what the fallen watchers did in particular, to contribute to the ruin of the lovely peaceful and innocent but highly educated race that humanity once used to be. Samyaza taught witchcraft to men. He and Azazel introduced corruption, iniquities and greed in men, and both of them took turns to disclose to men what kind of evil magic took place in their homeworlds of Procyon and Draconis. Azazel also taught men to make swords, knives, shields, armors and mirrors and encouraged them to go to war with the God-loving people who were then called the people of God and to exterminate them. He also taught the fabrication of bracelets and of ornaments, the use of paint and the art of coloring one's eyebrows, of using precious stones to make jewelry so that the world became corrupted with greed and materialism. He convinced the women not to bother with education and to only worry about appearing alluring and beautiful to men, which occupation had till then not been a priority with them. Amazarak taught all the sortilege, curses and enchantments and again the magical properties of roots. Thus none of them got to be acquainted with the divine mysteries that were their birthright. Bakial taught the art of star-gazing and sent his students to go around telling and extorting fortunes from their neighbors. Tamil taught astronomy and Asaradal taught the movement of the moon, and encouraged people to rely on planets for their lives and fates instead of on God. Yekam, one of Lucifer's own war officials who lead the galactic rebellion with him, is the one who, on the advice of Lucifer, actually made the speech to seduce the extraterrestrial guards and talk them into going and procreating children with human beings. Kesab even used his special powers to inspire ideas of lust to those watchers that were hesitant, and then pushed them to go and have sexual intercourse with human women. And Gadril, as well as luring Eve into a long carnal relationship with him, also taught the humans the ways of inflicting death quickly and slowly. It was also at this time that Cain murdered Abel, and the true time of Adam and Eve's transgressions, when they mated with the extraterrestrials. Gadrel also taught them how to make the instruments that inflict death and torture, also those that can help avoid death in war. This was actually when Adam and Eve were thrown out of the holy city. 
Kosyad is the one who revealed the most diabolic and evil arts to the children of men. He taught them how to practice abortions, which were then forcibly practiced on the women of the people of God. Tenemu by his power revealed bitterness, softness and sweetness, in other words he taught hatred and prejudice, as well as sensuality to the humans, and he uncovered to them all the secrets of false wisdom. Thus by him, humanity has seen multiplying those that have lost and mislead themselves and others in their vain wisdom, from that time at the beginning till now, all those so-called scientists who have explained and continue to insist on explaining creation on earth to themselves, and to humanity in their own way. He is the one who teaches to atheists that there is no God, or to designate God as one of the visible things of creation, thus leading them and others to the practice of idolatry. It was also Tenemu who taught men to write, and showed them the use of ink and paper. For men were not created to consign their knowledge by means of paper. They were created and taught to imitate our purity and justice. Had they remained that way, they would never have known death. We have been giving you some of our means of remembering everything we teach you every day. That sweet liquid we give you to drink. You will see just how long you will remember our message and how it will help your brain faculties. The humans we created used to consign everything to memory. But as soon as they began using paper, their brain capacities quickly became atrophied and their memories began to fail them. Knowledge that belonged to all became a commodity only reserved to a few who then used it to become masters over others. Not only that, impiety increased, mindless fornication multiplied, the creatures transgressed and corrupted their ways. Now you can begin to understand what great harm the renegades did. For though they possessed some science, they kept it from the humans, but the bit they showed them was not always for all. The humans we created were never taught to eat meat, because we did not eat meat ourselves. Flesh and all product that comes from anything that has lived and been killed, do not belong in the human body. Such products are harmful to the human being. We had alternatives like milk and eggs, which are the only things coming from living beings worth eating by man. But the Nephilim were giants, as you already know. They used humans as their servants and made them bring and prepare all their food. Before long it became impossible to feed them. So they began to fall on the birds, the beasts, the reptiles and the fish to feed themselves, they also drank their blood. When the animals became rare to find, they fell on the humans, especially the men of God, and began to devour them in a savage and sickening orgy of cannibalism. But we Alianan simply could not allow all the hard work that we had done to be totally destroyed by the renegades. On Melchizedek's advice, we again contacted Adam and his wife, who had become disappointed with the renegades and had repented and reunited just before the birth of Seth, and had again begun to worship God. Their exile from the holy city had lasted a hundred years before we returned in force. By that we mean that after the war during which they had been chased away, they repented not long after that, but Melchizedek let a whole hundred years pass before he was sure of their sincere repentance, and allowed them to come and live with him again in the laboratory city, which by then was called the holy city. But that also took another very savage and bloody war between us and the renegades and their children and descendants. The renegades fled with many of the Nephilim. The remaining Nephilim were exterminated by us, after we chased them from our other city laboratories in which they had established themselves as gods. There, we had to again treat both Adam and Eve and render them pure and free from any alien diseases before Seth could be conceived and be born. Adam was then crowned king and high priest, with Eve as his queen. It was when Seth was born that Melchizedek was again confirmed as a Lyonin's ambassador. Adam and all leaders of the people of God who were later also kings established in their own kingdoms, paid tithes to him. We then helped Adam and Eve take control of the cities and to gather those few humans who had remained loyal to us, and who had also remained pure by not intermarrying with the Nephilim or the extraterrestrials. Adam and Eve taught Seth how to operate the transmitters that we left them with, in order to contact Melchizedek and us. He also taught his children. We left them after creating more batches of pure humans from Adam, Eve, Seth and the other pure humans. Adam's family was left to administer all divine rights and to lead the people as the leading pure family and people of God. 
Of course the renegades came back again, not too long after we had left, and proceeded to again wage war against our faithful people, and to interbreed with those humans who now lived in savage tribes throughout the planet. They are the ones who chased Adam and his people from the cities for the last time in a savage war with him. When news came to us of what Satan, his friends, the Watchers and their children were doing again on earth, an expedition led by Michael, Gabriel Raphael and myself, Uriel, came back to earth. By that time Enoch was now on earth, and he was the one who contacted us with the transmitter which he had taken over, after becoming the leader of the pure race. He was a scientist as well as a prophet and religious leader, keeping the faith in God among the few people that still believed. Melchizedek was the one who met him regularly and educated him. Enoch and other human scientists still had knowledge of the Eternity operation, and they administered it to those who were worthy. Calling us had only become necessary as a last resort to him after trying many times to exhort the Watchers to turn back from their wickedness. After our first visit, we took Enoch with us for some time on another planet of this universe. Nobody back on Earth knew where he had been taken or what had happened to him. There, the Watchers who had refused to follow Lucifer and who had been called back named him Enoch the Scribe. There he was instructed even more deeply into the mysteries. He was even taught how to adapt planets, and was given materials to do that. Enoch was later brought back to Earth, and was sent to talk to the fallen Watchers one last time, with the promise that if they came back they would be forgiven. He then went to talk to the Watchers and the Nephilim, but they refused to listen to him, and he barely escaped with his life after they tried to grab and kill him. That is when he used the materials we had given him and he adapted a large island that was nearly a continent. It was situated in the Atlantic Ocean, approximately off the coast of where Northwest Africa is now, and which extended as far as to be close to where the islands off the American continent, the Caribbeans are. That island was named Atlantis. Then a brutal war began between the humans helped by us, and the Nephilim and the Watchers helped by the Renegades. As the Wicked Ones could not very well protect themselves on the mainland and sustained heavy losses, they lost the war. All the Watchers and their wives were rounded up, taken to and then forced to live on that planet their ancestors had first adapted long ago. Many renegade watchers moved to bases in the Arctic and Antarctic polar regions of Earth. The Nephilim who were half-human and who could not support the polar climate of Earth, where some of their parents' bases had been, were allowed to go and live on Atlantis and to make their home on it. All those humans who had allied themselves to them also went to live with them. At that time, there were flying crafts on Earth which were owned both by the humans and the Nephilim. That war had lasted three years, and the Nephilim and their followers, who also had experienced the kind of suffering they had been inflicting on humans, were somehow subdued for a while. They became a great civilization, very scientifically evolved, but a very immoral one. They still rejected God and his existence and thrived in self-autonomy. Their only religion was science, as they believed that only science would help them create their own new world, a world without moral laws and a world without God. For having been brought up by their evil, perverted and bitter parents, they had all grown up and remained ruthless, wicked, violent and totally debauched, like their fathers and mothers before them. They were still in regular contact with their parents the Watchers, who now constantly roamed the galaxies, and their greatest obsession and primordial aim as they were taught by their parents, was to go back to our galaxy and vanquish Yahweh, the head of our Council of the Wise, because as long as he was still there, their dreams were never going to be realized. Their second obsession was that they were determined to win the whole of humanity on their side and to stop them from worshipping God or even remembering his name. Failing that, they aimed to kill them all. We again left, after assigning a new contingent of watchers for the humans, under the leadership of Melchizedek. The Atlantean Nephilim began to come again to the main lands and to befriend them. They again began to teach them all sorts of false doctrines, encouraging them to indulge in unnatural perversions and causing them to commit idolatry, and worship the stars, the planets, the fallen angels or renegades, and the watchers and themselves as gods. They ordered those who allied themselves with them to commit horrific murders by making human sacrifices to Satan and his three friends Lucifer, Leviathan, and Belial. 
For another three hundred years this state of affairs remained. The Nephilim and their fathers had built centers of culture all over earth, teaching their false doctrines and disobedience to initiates, who also went and opened their own training centers. Again they encouraged their followers to make war with and kill all those who worshipped God, and most of all to offer them as blood sacrifices. They were therefore not the great people that the young man from France would want you to believe they were. If that is what he will teach, nobody should believe him, he is a liar. The Atlantean civilization did not last long. By that three hundredth year, the majority of humanity had reached the height of depravity, debauchery and wickedness, and their influence had spread on the whole of earth. Those who agreed with them greatly outnumbered the people of God. Soon our watchers could not properly protect the faithful. As they had to constantly fight Atlantean airborne raids, all their earth bases had to be abandoned and they settled on temporary bases on Earth's moon, Luna. But even there, they were not safe from the Atlanteans. So they reported back to our government, and they asked for help from the Council of the Wise. When the Atlanteans' attempts to kill Enoch became very frequent, and it seemed that they were going to succeed, Enoch too contacted us. It was decided that this time, the Nephilim were going to be dealt with once and for all, and our watchers were sent reinforcements with orders to destroy Atlantis. In a week-long fighting, most of the Nephilim died. But quite a large number of them who already knew of the impending disaster escaped in space vessels. Many of them moved to the African continent. Others scattered themselves on the American continent. More others went to India. A great deal went to Ceylon where they built the original city of Pagan. Others went to where Korea now is and to China, also spreading to the Tibetan mountains and into Mongolia. The rest made homes for themselves on the neighboring planets on old bases that they adapted for themselves. Then Atlantis was sunk into the waters in a week-long series of explosions, earthquakes and fires provoked from above, and all pagan temples were destroyed on the continents. But unfortunately the Nephilim were still on earth and their followers were still loyal to them, and they continued, unabated, with their Satan worship, their idolatries and their debaucheries. They rebuilt their temples and before long they again began pursuing, murdering and offering the people of God in sacrifice to Satan, Lucifer, Leviathan, and Belial. Noah and the Flood Our watchers abandoned their bases on Luna as the Atlanteans who were now there, were regularly bombarding them, and as they had been weakened by all the constant fighting, they could no longer sustain any more attacks without heavy losses. And the people of God were left without watchers, with only Melchizedek representing us, and in a sorry situation, having to meet in secret by fear of being discovered and massacred. Unfortunately, Melchizedek never got involved in wars, and they could not count on him. Then came Noah. The transmitter had come into his possession by right of inheritance, as he too, like his father, had remained faithful to God. He was deeply versed into the law and the mysteries, and he spent all his free time gathering groups of people and intrepidly preaching to them to abandon idolatry, to turn from evil and wickedness, and back to God, and to faithful cohabitation with their neighbors. But now that the watchers had left, those renegades who had been exiled to their ancestors' planet bases began regularly to fly to earth and to influence the humans. Satan regularly came among them and taught them to hate Yahweh, all the lionin and all humans who were faithful to them and who believed in God and obeyed his commandments, telling them that only he, Satan, loved them and could give them better lives, and they believed him. So Noah's anger was kindled against all of them. Like those before him, even though he was part of a large family with several brothers and sisters, he found himself standing alone. Only three of his sons and a handful of good people sided with him, while the rest of his relatives, and people in his area of the world preferred the Nephilim and their debaucheries. Even his daughters refused to listen to him and they separated from him and married Nephilim. The Nephilim, pushed by their fathers, began again to personally terrorize the few people of God that were left in tiny communities around the world and to murder them. Their first targets, as usual were prophets, because they were those to whom Melchizedek and Elianin spoke, and who could tell people about God and about us. Noah's anger was worsened at the loss of his daughters. He went to preach to these giants, 
and one more time told their human followers that if they repented and saw the error of their ways they could still be saved. But instead of changing, they became even worse. Through marriage, the Nephilim began to multiply at an alarming rate all over the planet. They fought the people of God for their lands and possessions, and in Palestine, a very high prize was put on Noah's head. In the end, there were only Noah and his three sons Shem, Ham and Japheth who worshipped God and followed his laws. That is when Noah decided to ask for help from Elianin. So he used the transmitter and told Melchizedek of the state into which earth had again been reduced, and we were told. Finally the council of the wise had to admit that what had happened to the other colony planets had now happened to earth. Even though the creation experiment had been a complete success, it had once more been irremediably sabotaged, so a decision was taken. Yahweh, our leader, decided that simply provoking earthquakes on earth would not do, only a permanent solution was required in order to rid earth of the Nephilim and all the Satan worshippers. Because the plan of divine realization had been completely jeopardized, and people who should have spent their time doing what they had come to do, were wasting it worshipping those who had lost what they themselves were seeking, and murdering those who wanted to try, Yahweh our leader decreed that the whole lot of them had to be drowned, that way those who had lost their way could come back in our world to be told of their mistake and be given a chance to return and try again later, while a small group of pure people of God would be left to multiply and continue with the original plan. So Noah was ordered to build an enormous, three-story ocean-going ship in which he could shelter himself and those who went with him while the rest of the people would perish. Noah who was a scientist as well as a prophet of God had to ensure that many animals, fowls, reptiles, and others would survive, except all aquatic beings which were expected to survive. Those that were not too large came in couples of males and females, seven pairs of each species, and sperm and ovules from the very large ones were collected and preserved for recreation later by Noah. Notice that Noah was told, Make yourself an ark of gopher wood that is because at that time flying ships were composed of materials that do not exist on earth now, but that we could produce in the factories that we set up on earth. Wood was used only for building boats, ships, houses, furniture and other things but never for any flying vessels. Because with the technology that we used, wood simply would disintegrate and come apart during acceleration maneuvers. Notice also that Noah was advised to cover the ark inside and outside with pitch. This was to preserve the wood and make it impermeable to water. The description of the ark in the Bible should tell you exactly what it looked like, what its shape was. Make yourself an ark of gopher wood, make rooms in the ark and cover it inside and out with pitch. This is how you are to make it, the length of the ark, 300 cubits, its breadth 50 cubits, and its height, 30 cubits. Make a roof for the ark, and finish it to a cubit above, and set the door of the ark in its side, make it with lower, second, and third deck. That was a description that, to me is very clear, and if a drawing had been made of it, we would have got the shape of the ships now seen in your oceans. As I said, we now know of the contents of the story that is being given to the young man in France, and we shall try to give our details that will give our side of the story when necessary. We, therefore, refer to these passages of the Bible. Then Yahweh the Lord continued, For behold, I will bring a flood of waters upon the earth, to destroy all flesh in which is the breath of life from under heaven, everything that is on earth shall die. And you shall come into the ark, you, your sons and your sons' wives with you, for I will send rain upon the face of the earth forty days and forty nights. And Noah did all that the Lord had commanded him. All the fountains of the great deep burst forth. And rain fell on the earth forty days and forty nights. The flood continued upon the earth. And the waters increased, and bore up the ark, and it rose high above the earth. The waters prevailed and increased greatly the earth, and the ark floated upon the surface of the waters. And the waters prevailed so mightily upon the earth that all the high mountains under the whole heaven were covered, the waters prevailed above the mountains, covering them fifteen cubits deep. And all flesh died that moved upon the earth, birds, cattle, beast, and every man. Everything on the dry land died. Only Noah was left and those that were with him in the ark, and the waters prevailed upon the earth a hundred and fifty days. 
Genesis 717-24. Noah at that time was six hundred years old when he entered into the ark, and the flood came five days later, a flood of water, as it is written. That is the way in which the flood came to be in Palestine. There is absolutely no other way than this one. The passages that I have just quoted state very clearly that life was destroyed by waters only, and not by anything else, because it rained, and the land was flooded for a hundred and fifty days. So if the young man from France will come and say that Noah's ark was anything else than a sea-going ship, do not believe him, he is lying to you, and if he tells you that there was a nuclear intervention from a lionin, do not believe him, he is a liar. There is no statement of a cataclysm here. That is the word which is used in all the scriptures, together with earthquakes and expressions like the earth shook violently. And the Lord rained fire and brimstone from the sky. To indicate explosions and nuclear interventions. Besides, flood is a word that is usually used to indicate a sudden rise or influx of a very large amount of water. In French that word is deluge, inundation, and both synonyms are definitely connected with water. Therefore you must not believe the young man from France when he shall come and tell you that it was a nuclear explosion that destroyed humanity during the flood. He would also try to make you believe that Noah's ark was a space vessel, please, do not believe him, he is a liar. In the text it says that the waters increased and bore the ark with them. The waters rose so high that the ark also rose high above the normal ground level. It could only rise high above the earth as even the highest mountains were under the water. Moses' account clearly states in verse 18 that the ark floated on the face of the water. He did not say that the ark flew into the air and disappeared into the clouds. There is nowhere where it is written that Noah was asked to build a flying ship, and the word ship is profusely used in the Bible and other scriptures. So how did the situation get back to normal? It is written. But Elianin remembered Noah, and God made a wind blow over the earth and the water subsided, and the fountains of the deep and the windows of the heavens were closed, the rain from the heavens was restrained, and the waters subsided continually. At the end of a hundred and fifty days the waters had abated, and in the seventh month, on the seventeenth of the month, the ark came to rest upon the mountains of Ararat. And the waters continued to abate until the tenth month, on the first day of the month the tops of the mountains were seen. Genesis 8 1-5 And here, there is no longer any doubt that Noah's ark was indeed floating on the water. Because when the mountains began to show and the ark became so heavy that it could no longer float, it became wedged among the high peaks of the mountain. So the idea of Noah building a flying saucer, as the young man from France might allege, should be dismissed. Because if it had been a flying saucer, it would have been taken to the moon Luna, where it would have waited for the waters to recede completely, before simply flying back to earth and landing on a flat valley. Providing the people and animals with enough air to breathe on the moon would not have been difficult for the watchers who would have been in charge of them. But Noah and his sons had to wait for the ground to dry before finally coming down from the mountains and herding the animals with them, which was not an easy task. Why would he have wanted to add to his troubles, if there had been an easier way to get him and all the beasts in his care to the valleys all at once and quickly? And the passage about winds blowing is a normal phenomenon, especially for people living in tropical countries where torrential rains are current events. Strong winds always blow after such heavy rains, and that is exactly what happened in our story of the Great Flood. The whole of the planet as we have already said enjoyed a temperate climate in which there were no harsh winters or heavy snows, before the same flood, in Palestine. So when the young man from France will come and talk about God, Satan, Lucifer and all the fallen angels monitoring levels of radioactivity and dispersing it scientifically, you must dismiss him as someone spreading a mad concept. And those who follow him should beware of believing such a crazy idea. Trust the story of the Bible, and believe us a lion in, your creators, for we tell you the truth. We have never ever denied anything that we have said or done before, nor have we ever changed our story. And also I would like to attract your attention to the fact that Noah was asked to preserve only birds and animals, mammals and reptiles. The Bible states that all the living things on dry land perished. That means that all marine life was safe. 
Now that would not have been the case if we had dropped nuclear bombs on the planet as the young man from France would want you to believe. Not even aquatic life can be safe in the event of a global nuclear destruction of life on your planet. The Nephilim who existed on earth at that time and the people who descended from them all perished as it is written, they were all destroyed, beasts, birds, reptiles, children of men and sons of men. As it has always been in the course of earth's history, prophets are appointed by us among people who believe in God and who are ready and willing to obey us and be led by us. These prophets prophesied, talked and wrote mainly about the events concerning the country or continent where they lived in particular and the world in general. That is why all Jewish prophets discussed mostly the problems pertaining to Israel and Palestine, while American ones prophesied for the people who lived in the Americas, and so on with all the prophets and holy men who have lived throughout earth. So those parts of the planet that did not have prophets seem not to have been part of humanity of those times, having no history. But they still existed, all of them. Know that there were about seven groups of people who were advised to build such ships. Only in the course of history and upheavals on earth, their stories have been lost. There have also been other people who were instructed by us to build not only ships but also submarines. Getting Noah to build that ship was not an easy task. After he was told about the flood plans, he did not begin work straight away. For a long time he spent time in his prayer place, praying for the punishment not to be carried out. Melchizedek had to visit him twice in two weeks to urge him to begin building the ship. He was finally told that if he did not obey, he would die with the rest of his countrymen. Then he first moved from his village that was near the sea with his followers, and went to live on top of a high hill. There they began the work, and that is why the people of that area were mocking him for building such a large ship inland. But even then, it took a long time for that ark to be finished. For years he and his followers would stop working. Then Melchizedek would come and urge him to finish the ark. Noah and his people started the work three times, then they would stop each time and Noah would urge them instead to pray for the disaster to be averted. Also, they were impeded by the natives of the land where he moved to, before he began the building work. They were constantly attacked, also, some of the work on the ark was sabotaged, and they had to begin again. And when they were not sabotaging his work they mocked Noah and his people and insulted them. When the ark was ready, Melchizedek came and gave him an instrument, a sort of a whistle with which he called the beasts to him. Every time he blew it, any animals in the surrounding areas and as far as a hundred miles would head toward the sound. And it was not only Noah and his sons and his wife in the ark. There were about a hundred and fifty people with them in total. His sons had wives and children, who in turn also had children. Some of those grandsons and granddaughters of Noah were aged from between fifty and eighty years. And some of their children, Noah's great-grandchildren, were already grown up and married, others still small. The City and the Tower of Babel Well as it is written, Noah and his sons were advised to free all the animals and birds and reptiles. They separated in three main families and set on to repopulate their world. In their part of Palestine, they were the only survivors with their wives. So we came to assist Noah, who, you remember was a scientist, and who was told to speed up the repopulation. In fact, we also helped him build a scientific laboratory, and there we helped him produce multiple artificial pregnancies as we did at the time of Adam, producing dozens of children from each wife of his children in regular and close succession in large incubator machines. When their daughters were just thirteen they were made to marry and also helped with producing many children. So it was indeed Noah who was the ancestor of all those people who existed in that whole area that is now the Middle East. After this further mass breeding, Noah separated his people in three main groups and set each one of his first three sons at the head of these groups. Notice that only three sons of Noah are mentioned in the Bible, but he really had more, even when he was ordered to build the ark. But Shem, Ham and Japheth were the ones who were designated as leaders, and were ordained as priests over these groups. And to them were entrusted the keys to the mysteries as we gave them to humanity. Japheth's group went to the area of earth now called the Caucasus with all the lands and mountains surrounding. Shem's group remained in Palestine, 
stretching from the whole of the area now that encloses Lebanon, and down all the way to Saudi Arabia, while Ham's group went to Egypt. So before long, within 200 years, that area became highly populated. For a long time, the whole of the people who lived in the countries around Palestine had one common national language that was the ancient Hebrew I have already told you about. We did not just abandon humanity after helping with this mass production of children. Again schools were built where we sent some of our best teachers, who once more came and educated these first children. When there were enough centers of culture, with human teachers taking over the education of the rest of the populations, a lion in teachers left once more for the new planet where we were again doing creation work, and the humans were left to progress by themselves. However, humanity was by now definitely calling us the gods or Elohim. And though we never encouraged this, we also no longer bothered to stop them calling us gods. Watchers were left to monitor their progress, but they were stationed on the main bases which were situated on Luna, and on secret ones on Earth. But Melchizedek was the exception amongst the lionin who were in this solar system. He lived openly as king in the city then called Salem, where he had a large castle. There, the people of God regularly came and paid him tithes. Some other human communities, including the Egyptians, had transmitters. As they multiplied greatly as a family, the descendants of Noah began to migrate. A few of them, moved to the area where the country of Iraq now is, and further on. There they implanted themselves and multiplied greatly. And they built Erech, one of the best cities that had ever been built until then entirely by humans, with colleges and schools. Erech was built when Heber, from whom descended Abraham, now lived. It was a masterpiece of architectural genius, a square city of twenty miles aside. From each side came five large avenues that all converged toward the center of the city. About three quarters up to the center, these avenues came to a large circular road, which was about eight kilometers in circumference. There, within that circular road, was the administrative center of Erech. Again from this administrative center came four large avenues toward the center of the city. Again these four avenues converged to another large circular road and within the central area formed by that second circular road was the scientific center, and right in the middle was where the scientists of Erech decided to build their famous tower. Erech became thus a great center of culture, and was soon full of scholars and wise men. Many literary societies were formed as well as different associations and organizations. At that time Nephilim, the descendants of those who had left earth on flying vessels began coming back to earth. As these descendants of Noah progressed and admitted more and more Nephilim in their midst, they also became more and more materialistic. Their love and faith in God Most High faded and then finally died, to be replaced by deep-set hatred for God. Just a handful of them remained faithful. That is when the members of one of those societies, comprising of eminent scientists and Nephilim, decided to again, go to our home galaxy, or heaven. As it has always been when the people have stopped having need of God, their first aim has always been to get rid of belief in God in the hearts of their contemporaries, believing that they shall never achieve total freedom with faith in God still existing in others. Such an attitude is and has always been dictated by gods, and our archenemy Satan, together with his vassals. For the education of these people consisted also, apart from sciences, of materialistic doctrines and Satan and demon worship. With lecturers in satanic doctrines like the ones we are telling you about now, the same that are being given to the young man in France. For Satan and Lucifer, who began using humanity from the beginning, imparting knowledge to them in order to get them to do their bidding, have never missed an opportunity for doing so. In those days, angelic beings, or extraterrestrials, were seen more often and easily recognized, as they looked and dressed differently from the humans. The humans also saw the vessels in which they traveled, and which biblical prophets called chariots, solid clouds and the glory of the Lord, and which are described all over the Bible and other religious scriptures. It is written. Now the whole land had one language and one speech. And it came to pass, as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shina, and they dwelt there. And they said one to another, Come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. 
and they had bricks for stone, and slime for mortar. And they said, Come let us build us a city and a tower, whose top may reach unto heaven, and let us make us a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the whole earth. And the Lord came to see the city, and the tower which the sons of men had builded. And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one and they have all one language, and this they begin to do. Come, let us go down and there confound their language, that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from thence upon the face of all the earth, and they left off to build the city. Therefore is the name of it called Babel, because the Lord did there confound the language of all the earth, and from thence did the Lord scatter them abroad upon the face of all the earth. Genesis 11 1-9. Once and for all we shall tell you the truth about what did happen. All the population here spoke the same language, which was at that time the language of Adam, which was our very own language that resembles ancient Hebrew. What we are dealing with here is how Satan and the other renegades came again and tried to use humanity against us, and also provoke Yahweh our leader to become angry again with humanity. Now, even though the city itself was built entirely by humans, the tower was built because of, and thanks to the instruction, or doctrines, of the sons of men, who were Nephilim or the fallen ones. Now in those days, when men built many cities, we Elionin, who are described here as the Lord, never made it a habit of coming and seeing and inspecting all of them, as that went against our policy of leaving the humans to progress by themselves and never interfering with their lives and natural progress. Everybody knows that we would not worry over a mere building no matter how tall it was. There exist many skyscrapers now on earth whose top floors are in the clouds and anyone climbing on top of those buildings shall see nothing but the immensity of space. Therefore this tower that the people of Eric built was no ordinary tower. The tower that these people were trying to build was one that looked like the chariots in which the angels of God or extraterrestrials traveled, with a top which pointed toward heaven. That tower was to look like today's rockets found on earth. And the expression let us build a tower whose top may reach unto heaven means, let us build a machine which could fly, with its top pointing toward the heavens, for that is where we want to go. That way, the heavens could be reached. Or very simply, let us build a flying machine that will take us or help us reach heaven. And by heaven here you should understand that they meant our galaxy. That is proved by the rather weird sentence added immediately afterwards, dot. And let us make us a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the whole of the earth. You must understand that as times pass, the ways people express themselves change, and the way the writers of long ago used to make their descriptions and tell their stories is no longer similar to the way those of this era do. And both the ancient and New Testament books of the Bible usually use the word name to designate also the whole person bearing that name, most of all when it is the case of the name of God, and when it is the case of us Eliamin. So to fear or love the name of God is to fear or to love God. Sometimes God is simply designated as the name. A name also means a reputation. So, let us make a name for ourselves means let us make gods of ourselves or let us make ourselves equal to God or as powerful as God. Let us make a powerful, God-like reputation for ourselves. Of course, many precious parts of this story were taken out by those people who translated the scriptures from ancient Hebrew. If they had been left intact, humanity would know the whole true story by now. But this story, like many others had been diminished with the parts giving the complete explanations of the facts being left out for we would not go through the strenuous task of scattering people all over the planet, some with watchers and angels assigned to protect them during travels lasting up to forty years, over a mere building. No matter how high it was built. And the second important expression to be noted from the passage that I quoted is, lest we be scattered abroad upon the earth apostrophe dot 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 they feared being scattered abroad. When the people of Erech decided to become gods and dispense with our leader Yahweh's authority, they agreed that they could not totally be free to be gods in their own right, while the Almighty God was still being worshipped, and while Yahweh and our council of the wise still existed. So they decided to go to heaven, to our galaxy, and murder the members of our council of the wise, thus effectively killing God and then take over the ruling of the alliance and of our galaxy. 
for fear that Yahweh should come later as he had done before, and destroy their satanic society by splitting them up and scattering them abroad. Which they knew Yahweh our leader would definitely do. So they stupidly decided to go to heaven and eliminate him beforehand. But as usual we still had watchers who lived on earth, and others with galactic class space vessels, who regularly reported on all activities taking place on earth. The members of the Council of the Wise had been alarmed at the construction of this rocket. And when their spies learnt of the plans of the Nephilim, they reported back to us. Our leader Yahweh sent angels, this word means messengers in our language, to come down to earth and see this particular city and the tower being built in it. Sometimes as all scriptures readers have surely noticed, even angels are called the Lord. Even when they have given their proper names and declared that they were just heavenly beings who live in the presence of Yahweh, or God. They are given the name the Lord because they come with the word, the orders and commandments of God Yahweh. Therefore having been sent by him, they also wield the same authority as Yahweh and all Elyonin or God when fulfilling their duties. And when during a scriptural conversation someone had called an angel Lord, those who shall read this should understand that the biblical human personage speaking had meant Sir. Of course when a real angel of God himself had appeared to a prophet who uses the mysteries, the expression had meant exactly what it was supposed to mean, just like it does to ourselves Elyonin, when an angel of God appears to us. So messengers came and saw the tower and reported back to Yahweh, and he said in a speech to the council of the wise. These people are all united in their aims, they speak the same language, and now they begin to do this. And as they propose to attack our galaxy, if they are allowed to remain together, nothing shall stop them from actually attempting such a trip, when their knowledge has increased enough for them to build flying machines powerful enough for them to succeed. Obviously as you can see, our leader Yahweh, saw according to the descriptions made to him, that their rocket or tower was useless and could not help them achieve their aims, that is reach our galaxy. But the idea was there. So he contented himself with separating them. Therefore he sent an army of officers and messengers to come and confuse their language, so that they may not understand each other. The confusion here does not mean that the city people suddenly could no longer understand each other literally. The way it was done is clearly explained, they were scattered abroad from there, over the face of the earth. That means that these learned people were each taken by the watchers and placed separately in foreign countries where all the languages spoken were different from the Adamic Hebrew that these learned people still all spoke. Do not forget that only the language of those human scientists who were in Erech and who belonged to the renegade satanic society of the Nephilim was confused. They therefore were the ones who began speaking strange different languages to the people of the countries where they had been taken. Being thus isolated, they could no longer get together to plot things like building rockets to go to heaven. Of course, this did not take place quietly. There was a violent war with the Nephilim. Most of their space vessels were destroyed and a lot of them were killed while the rest again fled in the vessels they could escape with and scattered again in their renegade bases in this galaxy. After that triumph the armies of Elyonin destroyed the tower, rounded up the human scientists and gave them the choice of dying or being exiled abroad. These all chose exile and were thus taken each with his entire family to a different foreign country. Furthermore Yahweh our leader decreed that the names of the human scientists and leaders of that particular society should never be written down to be known later by humanity. So these people shall remain forever anonymous. That society was called the Akkadian Society by the human inhabitants of Erech. So, as a result of the intervention from our armies, the building of the tower was stopped. That was the entire and true reason why the building of the famous Tower of Babel was undertaken. From Erech the name of that city became Babel Erech. The word Babel is from Hebrew, Belol which means confuse. Later, Erech was dropped from the name, and name of the city became Babel. Therefore if the young man from France comes and tells you humans any fancy stories about how this happened, no one on earth should believe him, he is a liar. After these people were scattered, their rocket was destroyed and their centers of culture closed and the Akkadian society was disbanded. For a while the Nephilim stayed away from Palestine. Here, before I continue with our story. 
I shall first refresh your memory concerning the genealogy of the descendants of Noah through whom the law of God was kept. 1 Noah had. 2 Shem who had. 3 Arpax had, who had. 4 Sela, who had. 5 Heber, who had. 6 Peleg who had. 7 Ru who had. 8 Sarug who had. 9 Nahor who had. 10 Terah who had. 11 Abraham, Nahor, and Haran. You probably have noticed that from the time of Noah, we no longer bothered with destroying any people who descended from the Nephilim. That is because we had decided that just one group of people were enough to keep our legacy. What went on in Palestine and the whole Middle East also went on around the whole planet. We no longer bothered with the rest because no one amongst them was willing to follow our teachings or be faithful to us, even though some had managed to remain pure. Therefore, only those who had remained pure in line right from Adam interested us. We could not always continue to exterminate humanity. Those faithful people were thus those who we called our chosen people. And they and only they and their children and descendants were important to be named and remembered in the scriptures. It was for the purity of other nations on earth that we decided to be lenient. For many, like virtually the whole race of the black African people, simply stopped believing in God, but never intermarried with the renegades. Thus we again gave the divine law to the descendants of Abraham to keep, for the later enlightenment of humanity as a whole. Therefore when these are known as the chosen people it is not because we love the rest of humanity any less, or that they are deemed superior to the rest of the human race. All humans are loved and considered equal in our eyes and in the eye of God. And we chose a little African girl for this particular message because we know that many prejudices that should not be, exist now, and have existed for a long time on earth. This message is for those who until now have suffered prejudice and have been deemed unworthy by those who should know best. Therefore those who have suffered from this prejudice and who would not be willing to listen to those who have discriminated against them, should much more easily be willing to listen to and believe and follow this, our little messenger. No single nation should deem themselves worthier or more important or superior than others in the eye of God, for nobody knows God's will or God's ways better than God himself. 